You need a paper clip and make a homemade taser. <laughs> Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Oh. It's only take till we get there. Well, we gotta talk about, you know, what we're doing. I'm not talking. I'm not getting filmed because I'm looking for that chick. Are you sure? What chick? You know that we saw it? Whatever? Hell no! The girl I'm going after, man. Oh, the one that you said that you're coming to TI with your homie. Yeah. Which would be me. Hell no. <laughs> I got that all on tape now. Fucker. <laughs> so what's going on, John? I don't got They can't see you. Yeah. I'll say, what's going on, people? <laughs> Well, we actually we go across here, then, because you're, if you could, I mean, you can go that way if you want, but. It's jaywalking no matter what. It's gaywalking. That's a little different than jaywalking. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, how many people? It's been a while since we've done a video, uh, since I've done a video, anyway. The person who I'm with doesn't want to be on camera. He's afraid that all the women will stalk him, like, like a son of a bitch, so, I don't know. <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> oh, okay, now they can. <laughs> anyway, so, well, I figured today we'd do something special, something that I've never done before. Something that, well, John said he's done before, but John said a lot of things before that I have never done, so. Yeah, gotten a few chicks pregnant, I don't know. <laughs> No, we're gonna go to the library today here at my old stomping grounds in Thief River. And we're gonna be with the wrestling historian. Uh, actually, what we're, what we're doing is we're missing a, an episode of Monday Night Raw so we can go meet with this uh, historian, wrestling historian, who wrote a book about uh, pro wrestling in Minnesota. And because we live in the big state of Minnesota, and, well, we both care about history like that. I figured it'd be kind of fun to, to go and check it out. Because I'm always eager to figure, you know, to, to learn new things. And I've been kind of waiting for the day that they decided to do something like this. Bring somebody over here or, or have something that, of interest to, to myself, you know. Uh, to other people I know. So, his name is, I think, George Shire, I believe. Uh, tried to look him up, tried to look up some information about him, I didn't really find much. But he has a book on Amazon.com or whatever, so. Hopefully we can bring this camera in, I'm pretty sure he won't care. Right? <laughs> it should be a lot of fun anyway, we'll learn something anyway. I know John, you know, he doesn't want to learn anything during summer break, but you know, you learn every day. Yeah. Yeah. You learn every day, John. Yeah. I mean, we're learning right now that we should have. God of War, mighty Mars. Take up your sword and reach the stars. So this is what I was talking about. That's what we're gonna be seeing today. Talk about the history of wrestling, pro wrestling, not high school wrestling, but actual pro wrestling. And so I think it's going to be kind of fun to... Yeah, I think it's going to be kind of fun to, to learn all this stuff, so... As a big wrestling fan as I've been for... Ever since 1990, so... Finally this year being the first year I ever got a chance to go my first ever wrestling event live. And that was for TNA, so... <laughs> So it should be fun, this is where we're going to have a great library here, so it should be very educational. So, see you in a bit. Very fun. I'll get our guest. I'll give you a nice little intro before you go into anything. That's called putting me over. Yeah. <laughs> of course I'm going to put you over. We've talked before. We know how this works. Okay, uh, again, welcome everyone. Our guest uh, with us tonight is a pro wrestling historian, a pro wrestling insider, a radio host. You've done some wrestling work as well, too, but he was a manager. He's done a lot. But the thing he's here tonight to talk about is his work as an author. Uh, and it's uh, a great honor to talk about this book that he put out. A fantastic book about the history of pro wrestling in Minnesota. It's uh, titled Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling, Burn Gone Into the Road Warriors, which has received quite a bit of fanfare since its release. 
tell us more about the book and about himself is our special guest tonight. Let's give a big welcome now to author George Shire. Welcome to Thief of Her Falls. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. You know, I said that's called putting you over, and one of the things that's toughest for me is to uh, talk about myself. My wife would say that's probably not true, but it is. Uh, when I was going to finish up on the book and we were doing the uh, acknowledgments and the introduction, they actually wanted me to really go into detail about me, and that was the hardest, the doggone hardest part of the book is talking about myself, but Greg is, or Glenn is right. I, um, I actually worked very briefly for a small independent wrestling promotion as a heel manager. And that was absolutely a dream come true when you've got to get out there and do a little raving and ranting on a microphone and make people hate you, because I was the bad guy. And uh, it was a lot of fun when I had my wrestlers that I was uh, managing at the time. And so that, that was enjoyable. I did this book, um, man, I tell you what, I say in the introduction again that it's a labor of love. It's 40 years of, of uh, following the sport by collecting wrestling programs, attending cards all over the United States at different times. And many small towns, Thief River Falls and Places like this would have been some of those small towns when you'd have wrestling. Not very often, but it was fun to go to. So I'm going to let Greg, or why do I want to call you Greg? Oh, you're always throwing that Greg in there. It, 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 it's close. You should be Greg. Okay. I'm going to let Glenn, uh, he's got a little outline that he wants to go with, so we're going to do that. And then if anyone has any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll be glad to answer the questions. And before we go further, you said you did the managing. What was uh, your gimmick and your handle? Well, that was rather unique. Uh, I, this was for a, a promotion called Steel Domain Wrestling in the Twin Cities. And one of the wrestlers that they had, the primary wrestler, was a guy named Derek St. Holmes, who wrestled under the, the name of Old School St. Holmes. He would come to the ring, I don't know if... You guys remember Vern Gagne and Luthez and some of those real scientific wrestlers? Well, old school St. Holmes would come to the ring with a towel around his neck and basic wrestling uniform, the trunks and the tight or the boots. And his, his agenda was is that he was a wrestling as a scientific wrestler. And so as his manager, I would come out and I would start raving and ranting in the ring that he was better than Vern Gagne, Luthez, Jack Briscoe, Dick Hutton, Pat O'Connor, Wilbur Snyder, and we'd go on and on and get the crowd all worked out. And I was his manager named The Authority. Now the interesting thing was is that The Authority was anything but, as far as wrestling uh, a manager goes, but uh, I would come out and do that raving and ranting, and then my guy would cheat. And I would tell the referee that it was a scientific hold and stuff like that from ringside. And every once in a while, I got to interject some foreign object or do something, and it was entertaining. I actually took a couple of bumps that my wife never even knew about, where uh, they <laughs> dropped me on the mat and shook me up a little bit. But uh, it was fun. It was all in, all in fun for the show. One of the things that was interesting about getting over as this heel manager is as the authority, I told the promoter, I said, one of the things that the, the, the heel has to do is he has to make the crowd hate him. Do something that really irritates them. And one, one of the things was is that I'm the authority. So my wife makes me this black jacket with big A sequins on it. And on the back, I have this big A. And I had gotten into the ring at the time, and I told the people to shut up, that I was here to inform them of the greatest scientific wrestler ever. And I told them that this A on my back stands for authority. And of course, the crowd turned on me immediately because I'm not going to tell you what they shouted back to me, but it starts with an A, and they were ranting. <laughs> so I said to the promoter afterwards, I said, see, that's what you got to do. You got to make them hate you. We had a lot of fun doing it. And I had, my guy was the champion, and I had uh, their television champion, Gage Octane, if anybody ever heard that name on the independent scene. There was a few others. Wild Bill Irwin 
was a guy that I managed while I was doing this. And uh, uh, Adrian Lynch was another one. So enough about that. <laughs> now, uh, before we go into any discussion about uh, your, your great book, Let's get uh, everybody up to speed about George Shire, and uh, where do you originally uh, come from? Well, I, I, I think I came from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I was born in St. Paul, and as at the age of about four or five years old, I got a glimpse of wrestling. My parents used to go to the old St. Paul and Minneapolis auditoriums, in the Twin Cities. And though some of those memories are vague, I sort of knew I was hooked. But the long story short, and again, I don't expound on this greatly in the introduction to the book because again, it was hard for me to do this, but one of the things that I found was around 1959, 1960, my parents were going through a divorce. I was the oldest of six kids at the time and it was, to be blunt, it was major hell in the house and it wasn't a good thing. So I, I sort of found pro wrestling one night. I turned on the TV when my parents were in the kitchen screaming and yelling at one another, having their own wrestling match. And I turned on TV and there was uh, in the ring two wrestlers, both heels, bad guys, Tiny Mills and Stan Crusher Kowalski, and they were just beating the bejeebers out of some poor helpless guy on TV, and they were the bad guys, and I went, you know, this is cool. And I was hooked from, from that time on, and that was 1959. So for the next uh, eight or nine years, it was extremely important for me that I could get to the drugstore to get the latest wrestling magazine. I tuned into wrestling whenever it was on. I begged my dad, can we go to the matches? He didn't want to. Once I got my driver's license in 1967, there was no stopping me. I never missed another wrestling card in the Twin Cities, but then I was driving to places like Omaha and St. Louis and Kansas City and Indianapolis, and I fly to Boston and go down to Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth and Oklahoma, and it just seemed that wrestling all over was very interesting in those days. What was interesting about it is that Every area of the country had their own territory. Unlike today, for you guys that know about WWE, they have one product, that's what you get on TV. Well, back in the old days, there were anywhere from 25 to 35 different territories that ran individually of one another. And because we didn't have cable, internet, or any of the stuff that we do today, the promoters could tell you that they were bringing in so-and-so and he was going to be on the card and it was exclusive to, to you fans and we've got this match, every promoter in the country wanted it. They could get away with that type of stuff because the, uh, the fans didn't know what happened. And ironically, two guys that were maybe wrestling each other tonight in the matches you were going to see were probably tag team partners last night in St. Louis and you didn't know it or one of them was a bad guy and a good guy, and they switched back and forth. It was just really interesting, and I found that to be really fun. And there were about 3,000 wrestlers back in that day that traveled a lot by car. They'd, go from, they'd drive from Winnipeg to Chicago, wrestle in Milwaukee, maybe go to Kansas City, then go to Omaha. I mean, they put on miles like you wouldn't believe. Today, the difference, just to explain to you how it is different, when I said there was about 3,000 wrestlers back in that day that made money and traveled all around these territories. Today, with the WWE and TNA, two of the biggest uh, that are out there, the only ones that are out there, there's probably 100 guys that make any money. And there's no place for them to go because there are no more territories. So maybe later on we can talk about how that evolved too. Now, you also got involved with, uh, at a younger age, uh, with writing like for newsletters and, and stuff like that. Now, what kind of newsletters and whatnot did you get involved with, and uh, what kind of content was featured on what you did? Well, you know, I mentioned that there wasn't a thing called the internet or cable or anything like that back in, in the 60s, but one of the things that was very prominent back then 
where there were actually different types of wrestling fans in that day. There were fans that would go to the matches, go home and forget about it, and that was it. Then there were a select few that just were a little bit more involved in it. And there were a lot of fan clubs around. A wrestler could have a fan club run by one of his fans, and they would get people to subscribe to this bulletin, and they would uh, you know, offer the bulletin a couple times a year, six times a year, and then provide pictures of the wrestler. The wrestler would be available for those fans to you know, get pictures and that sort of thing. That was very big around the country, and one of the things that I started to do early on was write for many of these fan club bulletins. And then there were results bulletins, and that's where I really was intrigued. Because as I mentioned earlier about wrestlers maybe in St. Louis and then the next night wrestling in Minneapolis and you know they could have been opponents one night and tag team partners the next and I really found the results to be interesting and we started collecting and so what I would do is when I went to any wrestling card in Minneapolis St. Paul is I would always buy anywhere from 15 to 20 wrestling programs that were sold that night. I'd keep one for my collection. And then the others I would send off to correspondence. I had some wrestlers that I actually worked or had exchange situations with some of the promoters, but it was fun because I would get the program from St. Louis, I would get the program from Tampa, I'd get the program from Houston. So I always knew what was going on everywhere. And I just saved all these programs. And the funny thing is, is that I write a book on the, on the history of Minnesota wrestling, which is basically AWA, uh, oriented, but I could do a book on any of the 35 territories. I could do one on St. Louis, I could do one on Florida, Texas, it doesn't matter. I've got all the material and plus what's up here that's just uh, waiting to come out, so. And it was from that continued love of pro wrestling that you put together this fine book, uh, Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling, and with the help of the Minnesota Historical Society. Now, how did the idea of uh, doing this book come about? Well, there's another story too. You know, I, I, I think that the, the idea for the book probably came out as, as long as 10 years ago or even longer. But uh, as wrestling changed in the 80s and evolved into what it is today, which is an entirely different product in presentation and really what it is altogether, uh, I have seen just an influx of books from not only wrestlers that have, have done books and you know old school wrestlers, but a lot of people, it's always interesting to me is somebody thinks it's easy to write a book and there have been people that have written some wrestling books and there's so much misinformation in the book. And my wife will tell you and my kids will tell you nothing will drive me more crazy than if I read something in a book and it's not right, it's not correct. They either didn't do their homework or they didn't know or they just put it in there for whatever. And it was about uh, 10 years ago, I was looking at a particular book and my youngest daughter made the comment to me when I was complaining about it because there were pictures that were, uh, they had wrestlers names under the wrong pictures and things like that in the book and I complained about it. And she said, well, Dad, why don't you just write your own book? <laughs> okay. And, and the funny thing is, is that I'm sure everybody has heard at some point or another, you've either made the comment, you know, I could write a book or you've heard someone say to you, you know, you should write a book. That's the easiest part of it. I had written for many of those fan club bulletins and I also wrote for national uh, newsstand wrestling magazines over the years, Wrestling Review, Wrestling World, Wrestling News. And it's always easy, at least for me, to write a column, a two-page column or a two-page story on a particular wrestler, but when you have to sit down and do a whole book, it was a very interesting project. And working with the History Center, who absolutely were phenomenal people as far as their talent staff to work with. Uh, when you're working 